Well, it's good to be here today. Uh, I was very surprised when Earl asked if I would give a four-hour lecture on a Sunday afternoon, but I said, well, that's more than fine. So we'll do a break about 6 p.m. I'm just kidding. Um, I hope to talk today probably around 45 to 50 minutes, a little less than an hour, giving an overview of the development of Catholic biblical scholarship over more or less the last century. Uh, it's really been a remarkable period in the history of the church, a remarkable period uh, in scholarship. And I feel, as I put my talk together and tried to reflect upon this history, I feel that we're at the end of an age and at the, new, at the beginning of a new age. And this is a really appropriate time uh, coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council at the beginning years of the 21st century to look at where we've been as a church in the use of sacred scripture and the study of sacred scripture and where the, the study of scripture may be going in the years to come as the Catholic Church continues to try to always put the word of God at the center of its life and its proclamation of Jesus Christ. Uh, the basic outline of my talk today, I want to begin uh, talking about the roots of modern biblical scholarship, give a very brief overview of how modern biblical scholarship arose during the Enlightenment and the 19th century. Then I want to turn to the modernism crisis during the papacy of Pope St. Pius X at the beginning of the 20th century. If I were giving this talk 100 years ago, I would halfway through have been escorted out the building and excommunicated from the church for a lot of the things I'll say which were proclaimed by the Second Vatican Council uh, and which have become part of the Catholic heritage for understanding Scripture. I want to look then at what I think is the most important papal encyclical of the 20th century, Divino Afflante Spiritu by Pope Pius XII, which marked a turning point in the Catholic attitude towards modern Scripture scholarship, and then look at briefly the documents of Vatican II and the way that the work of modern scholars and the leadership of Pius XII really bore fruit in the Second Vatican Council and the flowering of the Catholic biblical scholarship tradition. And finally, I want to look at uh, recent writings by our current Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, as he's looked back upon a century or more of scholarship, tried to draw what is of lasting value from it, and to point a way towards the future. So that'll be the basic outline of my talk. To begin, starting with the roots of modern biblical scholarship, we go back to the beginning of the modern period with the Council of Trent. And at the Council of Trent, the church is responding to the Protestant Reformation, the claims of Luther and the other reformers that scripture alone is the only authority for Christian doctrine. And when the council laid out the canon of the Bible dogmatically, it also laid out what it means to be a Catholic interpreter of the Bible. And to be a Catholic interpreter of the Bible is to read the Bible in agreement with the tradition of the church. In the fourth session of Trent in 1546, the council fathers decreed, no one relying on his own skill shall in matters of faith and of morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, resting the sacred scripture to his own senses, presume to interpret the said sacred scripture contrary to that sense which Holy Mother Church has held and does hold, or even contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers. So at the beginning of the modern period, the Council of Trent affirms that Scripture is a servant of the church. Scripture is to be read in accord with the unchanging tradition of the fathers, the scholastics, and the teaching magisterium office of the church. And this is against... Protestant approaches to Scripture, which would place Scripture in opposition to the authority of the church. And that worked well for the Catholic Church, but in some ways the Catholic tradition fell outside of many of the intellectual streams that began to emerge in the early modern period. Uh, the first modern biblical scholar, in many ways, is a philosopher, a Jewish philosopher, Benedict Spinoza, one of the greatest figures of the Western philosophical tradition, excommunicated from the Dutch synagogue in the middle of the 17th century. And Spinoza turned his attention to the Bible and was the first 
a philosopher to say, when we read the Bible, the Bible should be interpreted just the way that every other phenomena of the world is interpreted for the Enlightenment, according to human reason. The rule for biblical interpretation should be nothing but the natural light of reason which is common to all, not any supernatural light or external authority. So Spinoza rejects any tradition, any claim of the supernatural, which would help us to understand Scripture and insist that Scripture should be interpreted the same way the life of Julius Caesar or a chemistry experiment would also be interpreted, which is very much in keeping with the modern rise of the sciences and the modern rise of an anti-supernatural attitude in general. But modern biblical scholarship takes a decisive historical turn uh, during the 19th century. And F.C. Bauer, a German scholar, uh, is often considered the father of modern historical critical methodology. Uh, in the 19th century, as German Protestant scholars turned their attention to Scripture, they became very aware that the documents that we read before us in the Bible are products not just of God, but of human beings in a very distinct culture, a very distinct time and place in history, and that we have to take very serious attention to the human element and what can be known historically about scriptures. And Bauer goes further than the tradition by saying even the claims about Jesus, the claims that Jesus is the Messiah or the Redeemer, are themselves historical claims that have to be judged by the light of historical science and historical research. Whether the person of Jesus, he writes, really possesses the attributes which belong to the established concept of the Redeemer is in fact a purely historical question, which can be answered only through a historical invest investigation of the literary sources of the gospel stories. So Bauer rejects any dogmatic any theological framework being brought to bear on the interpretation of Scripture. The books of the Bible, according to Bauer, are historical documents, and it's illegitimate to bring theological assumptions to the interpretation of historical documents. This attitude towards Scripture is continued by one of his students, David Friedrich Strauss. Strauss is, uh, in the year 1835, he issued a book the Life of Jesus Critically Examined. And this book is considered perhaps the most explosive book of the 19th century in terms of theology, in which Strauss said, we have to radically reinterpret and reconstruct what we can know about the person of Jesus in light of modern philosophical research and modern historical research. Strauss rejected Christian tradition as a framework for biblical interpretation and actually called into question most of the historical claims of the Bible. While Bauer would certainly emphasize that Scripture needs to be interpreted in light of historical criteria, Strauss is highly critical of any historical claims in the Bible. As the mode of explanation for the Gospel accounts we're now advocating denies all confidence in the historical authenticity of the record, all the details must be in themselves problematic. Strauss had the, uh, the great honor of, when he published his book, he had to flee. The Swiss peasants came to town with pitchforks to uh, lynch him, literally. And uh, when he died in the 1870s, he refused the Christian sacraments. He refused a Christian funeral. Very much in keeping with uh, some of the atheistic tendencies and radical tendencies of this 19th century historical tradition. But this isn't just a Protestant phenomenon. Bauer and Strauss are both Protestants, but perhaps the most popular book of the 19th century on the life of Jesus was by a former Catholic priest, Ernst Renan, uh, who wrote The Life of Jesus. It went through I don't know how many editions. It made him a very rich man, I believe. And Renan, building upon the historical criticism of earlier scholars and having left the priesthood himself, and I believe the church, um, 
decided that what we can really say about Jesus is not any of the supernatural claims, not any of the dogmatic claims that the church has held, but rather we should see Jesus as in many ways a first century version of a 19th century liberal European liberal. Jesus was no longer a Jew after cleansing the temple. Jesus proclaimed, he says, the rights of man, not the rights of the Jews, the deliverance of man, not the deliverance of the Jews. For scholars like Renan, the importance of Jesus was that, in fact, he was a modern, secular European who had been covered up by mythology and by doctrine over the centuries, and that if we stripped away all these layers of Christian belief, we'd really find someone who looked very much like ourselves and very unlike the Christ of faith, as we would call him. Both within and without the Catholic Church, this rise of modern biblical criticism presents a fundamental challenge to the Christian tradition in the 19th century. And many of the scholars who are practicing this are avowed critics of established religion. In the 19th century, biblical scholarship was very much the province of individuals who were dubious about and highly critical of organized Christianity. And many of them saw this scholarship as a means of undermining the authority of the church and undermining the moral authority of traditional Christianity. So we shouldn't be surprised that they didn't, did not get a very positive hearing within the Catholic Church. However, in 1893, the Catholic Church finally responded uh, through the person of Pope Leo XIII in a rather systematic way to some of these modern trends in scholarship. In 1893, Leo XIII issued the encyclical Providentissimus Deus, which is the founding document for modern Catholic biblical scholarship. And Leo actually takes a very, I think, moderate stance towards a lot of these attempts to do historical research on the Gospels. He's critical of it. He recognizes that a lot of this scholarship is aimed uh, at the church rather than at a disinterested uncovering of the historical past. And he writes, there's a risen in, to the great detriment of religion an inept method dignified by the name of the higher criticism, which pretends to judge the origin, integrity, and authority of each book of the Bible from internal indications alone and apart from the tradition of the church. And he's very critical of these scholarly attempts to undermine traditional Christian belief. However, he doesn't entirely rule out the, va the value of such approaches. And he writes... Uh, it's clear, on the other hand, that in the origins and the handing down of writings, the witness of history is of primary importance, that historical investigations should be made with the utmost care, and that in this matter, internal evidence, meaning the evidence of the text itself and its historical context, is seldom of great value except in confirmation of what Christians already believe. So by the end of the 19th century, as we draw the 19th century to a close, the Catholic Church has taken kind of a wary, neutral stance towards a lot of these scholarly trends. Leo refuses to condemn biblical scholarship full court, but he says, it's not clear that this will really uncover very much that we don't already know, and many of the people doing it aren't to be trusted, but providentissimus deus opens the door for Catholics to engage to a limited extent for Catholic scholars to do this kind of research with the hope that by bringing a Catholic voice into this largely Protestant field, uh, the Catholic Church can make its own claims and beliefs better known and better defend its tradition. Leo was an optimist who was very interested in engaging European society and European intellectual culture of his time. For better or for worse, Leo's successor, Pope St. Pius X, uh, had a much more adversarial attitude towards the intellectual trends of the time. And very early in his pontificate, in the middle, in the middle years of the first decade of the 20th century, 
what's called the modernist crisis arose in which Pope Pius X saw many of these intellectual trends coming together as a conspiracy to destroy Christianity and decided they need to be, needed to be taken on, confronted, and cast out of the church. And he was really given a lot of ammunition in his internal campaign within the church by some Catholic scholars who he identified as proponents of this tendency. Perhaps the most famous of the modernist scholars that Pope Pius X uh, engaged was Alfred Loisy. I love to say that word, Loisy. Uh, actually an exceptionally fine biblical scholar. Uh, a priest until he was excommunicated in 1908. And the most famous quote from Loisy, when he looked at the early church, he said, Jesus came preaching the kingdom and what arrived was the church. Which, in fairness to Loisy, I don't think he meant ironically. I think Loisy was simply pointing out that Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God, and historically the church arose among his followers as an institution. However, many, to be as generous as I can to him, many people tagged on to that quote and said, there you go. Jesus never intended the church. Jesus never intended to establish an institution and the church is an illegitimate heir to the message of Jesus. Another figure, very interesting, was uh, George Tyrell, an uh, English Jesuit. Tyrell, I'm not an expert in Tyrell, but um, he was kind of a sad figure. I'll do my Tyrell pose here while I uh, give my talk on him. Ultimately, uh, Tyrell's he was excommunicated, not by the Pope, by his local bishop. His local bishop denied him the sacraments, uh, and he died in 1907. He died a couple of years after that. He was a frail and sickly man. But he was critical of the institutional church as well, uh, writing that, I make the saints and not the theologians, the teachers of Christianity. The Spirit of Christ, whatever that means, him, uh, rather than Christ himself, is the creator of the church. So Tyrell was very critical of the development of the church historically, especially in the modern world, and ultimately despaired of institutional Christianity. And believe it or not, popes tend to like institutional Christianity. And Pius X, more than many popes, was very fond of institutional Christianity and saw these scholars, saw these thinkers as enemies of the church and by casting them out and by systematically opposing their teachings, believed that he could defend the church for many of the very correctly, I think as he diagnosed it, dangerous trends that were sweeping European civilization at the time. When Pius turned in 1907 to the modernist crisis as he saw it, he wrote, can anybody who takes a survey of the whole system of the modernists, be surprised that we should define it as the synthesis of all heresies. Were one to attempt to task the, collect, the task of collecting together all the errors that have been broached against the faith and to concentrate the sap and substance of them all into one, he could not have better succeeded than the modernists have done. So, Pius takes a critical stance towards a wide range of intellectual attempts to have the Catholic tradition engage the modern European culture, the modern European society of his time. And he takes a special offense at the work of many of these biblical scholars, such as Loisy and many of the Protestant scholars. And uh, in his encyclical Pascendi, uh, Feeding the Flock of Christ, he takes on an ironic tone. To hear these modernists, this is Pius X talking, to hear these modernists talk about their works on the sacred books in which they have been able to discover so much that is defective. One would imagine that before them, nobody ever even glanced through the pages of Scripture. Whereas the truth is, 
that a whole multitude of doctors, infinitely superior to them in genius, in erudition, in sanctity, have sifted the sacred books in every way. And so far from finding imperfections in them, have thanked God for his divine bounty in having vouchsafed to speak thus to men. Unfortunately, he continues, these great doctors, Bonaventure, Aquinas, Augustine, did not enjoy the same aids to study that are possessed by the modernists for their guide and rule. A philosophy borrowed from the negation of God and a criterion which consists of themselves alone. So under Pius X, modern biblical scholarship basically grinds to a halt within the Catholic Church. Any of the historical, archaeological, uh, linguistic tools which are being used by mainstream scholars are seen as a threat to the traditional understanding of Scripture. And Pius also makes a very important decision uh, the same year when he decrees that the Pontifical Biblical Commission, an institution which had been established by Leo XIII about five years earlier, he gave it dogmatic authority. We find it necessary to declare and decree that all are bound in conscience to submit to the decisions of the Pontifical Biblical Commission relating to doctrine, which have been given in the past or which shall be given in the future. Nor can all those escape the note of disobedience and consequently of grave sin who in speech or writing contradict such decisions. So on a juridical level, Pius X gave a office in Rome the ability to make dogmatically and morally binding interpretations of Scripture which set out the boundaries within which any biblical scholar had to operate. And that's, it makes it very difficult to do creative scholarship uh, in such a legal framework and also sends a chilling atmosphere throughout the church. And for about 35 to 40 years after Pius X, uh, Catholic biblical scholarship really did not flourish. It was uh, a dangerous task. You, would, you were much better advised if you were a young priest with a good mind hoping to go into the academy to find a different field to go into uh, because it was very easy to get into trouble in that field. Things begin to change in the early 1940s. In 1939, uh, Pope Pius XII is elected to the papacy. And Pius XII in our culture is very often portrayed as a very conservative and a very old-fashioned and a very narrow pope. And thank goodness we got over that. Uh, I don't think anything could be further from the truth. Pius XII is truly one of the great reforming popes. If you do a study of Pius XII's work in the church, he laid the groundwork for most of the work of Vatican II and did a huge number of reforms to the liturgy and to scholarship, uh, which made possible everything we enjoy in the church today. And you get a wind of this starting in 1941. In 1941, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle in Italy. There was a popular pamphlet circulating, uh, circulating among the people, and it claimed that the right way to interpret Scripture was a mystical interpretation, and that this scientific historical style of research was dangerous. And it was an anonymous pamphlet that was circulating about, kind of like, I guess, the closest equivalent to something going viral on YouTube that you had in 1941 Italy. And Pius actually, Pius XII actually, when he addressed the uh, Italian bishops, brought up and wrote, a, wrote a, uh, a response to this pamphlet. And in it he writes, this pamphlet pretends to be a defense of a certain type of exegesis called meditative or spiritual. But it is before everything else a virulent attack against the scientific study of the Holy Scriptures, the philological, meaning linguistic, historical, archaeological, etc., study of the Bible, according to this pamphlet, is nothing but rationalism, naturalism, modernism, skepticism, atheism, and so forth. 
To really comprehend the, the Bible, the pamphlet claims, one must give free reign to the Spirit as though each individual were in personal communion with the divine wisdom, as the first Protestants supposed. This is a very clever move, I think, by Pius XII, uh, to actually, it lays the groundwork for defending biblical scholarship as the authentically Catholic approach to Scripture, as opposed to the Protestant tradition. Uh, within the polemics of the time, uh, Pius XII is actually here in a very subtle way saying that the very methods which Pius X had condemned as a threat to the church actually are the methods of the church. And this sent a lot of uh, ripples through the church at the time and through the scholarly community. And two years later in 1943, Pius issued his great encyclical Divino Aflante Spiritu, uh, with an outpouring of the divine spirit, which is his encyclical on biblical studies. It's published in 1943 on the 50th anniversary of Leo XIII's Providentissimus Deus, and they tend to like to do that, to find anniversaries to issue important documents on it. And in this encyclical, Pius XII opened the gates for modern biblical scholarship in the Catholic Church. After almost 40 years of a great deal of concern that these methods were suspect and perhaps led to heresy and led to excommunications. Pius XII embraced the modern scientific study of Scripture as a viable and as an important and maybe even a necessary way to read the sacred word in the modern world with our scientific and historical consciousness. And he begins by looking back on the previous 50 years and says, there's no one who cannot easily perceive that the conditions of biblical studies and of their subsidiary sciences of archaeology, textual, and linguistic studies, etc., have greatly changed within the last 50 years. No longer is biblical scholarship like this primarily the work of people outside the church attacking Christianity, it has increasingly become the tool of faithful Christians seeking a deeper understanding of Scripture. All these advantages, he continues, which, not without a special design of divine providence, our age has acquired, are as it were an invitation and inducement to interpreters of the sacred literature to make diligent use of this light so abundantly given to penetrate more deeply, explain more clearly, and expound more lucidly the divine oracles. As I said at the beginning of my talk, Divino Aflante Spiritu, I think, is the most important encyclical of the 20th century. It fundamentally changed the way Catholics study Scripture, and by doing so, it laid the groundwork for the reforms of the church at Vatican II which attempted to rediscover the riches of Scripture as the basis of theology, and it brought Catholic scholars into close dialogue with ecumenical scholarship, Protestant scholarship, and non-Christian scholarship, since it embraced historical and scientific methods that are common to all modern biblical scholars. Pius is unambiguous. Pius XII is unambiguous here in embracing modern historical critical scholarship. Being thoroughly prepared by the knowledge of the ancient languages and by the aids afforded by the art of criticism, let the Catholic exegete undertake the task of all those imposed on him the greatest, that namely of discovering and expounding the genuine meaning of the sacred books. And in the performance of this task, let the interpreters bear in mind that their foremost and greatest endeavor should be to discern and define clearly that sense of the biblical words which is called literal. In other words, the historical meaning. When we read the Gospel of John, what did John in the first century mean by the words that he wrote? That's the literal meaning. And that may or may not agree perfectly with the way the church has interpreted it over the centuries. And Pius is saying, if we're going to be honest to the Bible, we have to first ask, 
What did the Bible mean before we can ask ourselves, what does the Bible mean? Pius X had attempted to conflate these two things and to say what the Bible meant and what the Bible means are identical and don't ask any more questions. And Pius XII says, it's not that simple. And if we really believe in the truth of our faith, we won't be afraid to ask those questions. As a result, Pius gives a new freedom to biblical scholars. I couldn't find any better illustrating picture there, so I picked something silly. The true liberty of the children of God, which adheres faithfully to the teaching of the church and accepts and uses gratefully the contributions of profane, meaning secular science, this liberty upheld and sustained in every way by the confidence of all is the condition and source of all lasting fruit and of all solid progress in Catholic doctrine. This is Pius's fundamentally, Pius XII's fundamentally different attitude than Pius X. Pius X saw these critical scholarly methods in an adversarial light. These are threats to and opponents of the Catholic faith which need to be kept at a distance. And Pius XII, very correctly, I believe, as a scholar, said, no, if there's truth to be found, Catholic scholars should be a part of finding that truth. And rather than think juridically in terms of uh, who's in control of the Catholic scholars, we should entrust more to their own sense of liberty and fidelity to the church. Pius is less concerned with identifying who gets to punish bad scholars, and more concerned with encouraging good scholars to work within their own faith to spread greater light on the Catholic tradition. As I said, Divino Aflante Spiritu lays the groundwork for everything that follows in the church. Without that encyclical, the church that we have now would not and could not exist. And it finds its fruition and it finds its triumph, this embrace of biblical scholarship, finds its true completion in the very documents of Vatican II. At the Second Vatican Council, where John XXIII and Paul VI attempt to renew the church, to reform the church so that it can more effectively engage and proclaim the gospel to the modern world, there was a great awareness that over the centuries since the Council of Trent, well, I mean, I think the common parody is that the Protestants got the Bible and the Catholics got the sacraments. And at Vatican II, I think the underlying message is we don't have to make that choice. And in fact, we cannot make that choice. The sacraments and scripture are two manifestations of the same divine revelation and the same saving history that all Christians enjoy. Not surprisingly, the Second Vatican Council is an ecumenical council that says, by Catholics rediscovering and reappropriating Scripture, we can better reach out to our fellow Christians and build greater bonds of unity and greater bonds of cooperation. Dei Verbum, the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation in the church, reads, the church has always venerated the divine scriptures, just as she venerates the body of the Lord, especially in the sacred liturgy. She unceasingly receives and offers to the faithful the bread of life from the table, both of God's word and of Christ's body. She has always maintained them and continues to do so together with sacred tradition as the supreme rule of faith. Since as inspired by God and committed once and for all to writing, Scriptures impart the word of God himself without change. So the underlying pattern of thought at the Second Vatican Council was reform and renewal in the church demands rediscovering scripture among all Christians and placing scripture squarely at the heart of our reflection upon the mystery of God and the saving mystery of Christ. This is 20 years after Divino Aflante Spiritu, 1943 until the early 60s, 
The dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum, was actually, I think, the last major document approved by the council. This conciliar document on revelation and scripture and the study of scripture uh, took a while to come together. And actually, it went through about five drafts. Originally, the way it worked at the council, <coughs> they would appoint a committee of theologians to put together kind of a draft document called a schema, which the bishops would then look at. And the first draft document was a very conservative one, which uh, did not really acknowledge, I think, a great deal of what Pius XII had attempted to do and very much uh, took a a more conservative approach to talking about revelation and scripture. And the bishops rejected it overwhelmingly. And what finally came out of a very long process of debate and discussion and theological discernment was Lumen Gentium. On the way to this big conciliar document, though, uh, in 1964, the Pontifical Biblical Commission uh, released a document called uh, Sancta Mater Ecclesia, or popularly known as On the Historicity of the Gospels, that tried to give guidance to how biblical scholarship should take place. And in this document, uh, the Pontifical Biblical Commission said, let the Catholic exegete, the Catholic scholar, following the guidance of the church, derive profit from all that earlier interpreters especially the fathers and doctors of the church, have contributed to the understanding of the sacred text and let him carry on their labors still further. In order to put the abiding truth and authority of the gospels in their full light, he will accurately adhere to the norms of rational, meaning scientific, and Catholic hermeneutics. And he will diligently employ the new exegetical aids above all those which the historical method, taken in its widest sense, offers to him. The historical critical method. A method which carefully investigates the sources and, divine, and defines their nature and value and makes use of such helps as textual criticism, literary criticism, and the study of languages. So the document of the Pontifical Biblical Commission coming out of the Second Vatican Council uh, as part of the discussions which would produce Lumen Gentium embraces the historical critical method, embraces modern scientific study of scripture uh, as the preferred method of studying the Bible. Not just a good method, not just an important method, but I think the preferred method for scholars elevating it even more. Not only is it permissible to do this, it's probably a good thing to do this. Finally, in Dei Verbum, the council fathers say, since God speaks in sacred scripture through men in human fashion, the interpreter of sacred scripture, in order to see clearly what God wanted to communicate to us, should carefully investigate what meaning the sacred writers really intended and what God wanted to manifest by their words. Emphasizing two layers to scripture, a human layer of human language, human meaning, human culture, which the human authors used to write the text, and lying behind this, a divine message which God wishes to impart. And the council fathers say, the way to find God's message in the Bible is first to understand the human form of this message. But, and there's always a but, the council reaffirms, I think, what Leo XIII, Pius X, and Pius XII have all said. When you're doing scripture scholarship as a Catholic, you're doing scripture scholarship as a Catholic, which means you belong to a community of believers and you belong to the church. And the living tradition of the whole church must be taken into account along with the harmony which exists between the elements of the faith. It's the task of exegetes 
to work according to these rules towards a better understanding and explanation of the meaning of sacred scripture so that through preparatory study, the judgment of the church may mature. For all of what has been said about the way of interpreting scripture is subject finally to the judgment of the church. This is the constant theme of Catholic biblical scholarship. And we'll see this, we've seen it before, and we'll see it again. The Bible belongs to the community of believers, to the church, not to the individual scholar. And Paul, wants to, Paul VI wants to emphasize this when he writes that Scripture scholars need to pursue their studies in accordance with the recent scientific uh, method. Biblical scholars have a tough task, and they need to be up-to-date on methods, but at the same time, they recognize that God has entrusted the sacred scriptures not to the private judgment of scholars, but to the church. Paul VI, a very misunderstood pope in many ways, uh, in the same document in which he encourages scripture scholars to always exercise their art, exercise their science within the life of the church and in service to, in service to the church makes a very big decision too. And in that same document, this is Vaticanese. Uh, this is bureaucratic language from the Vatican. But the, the nutshell, the, the heart of this is the Pontifical Biblical Commission, which since Pius X had had dogmatic authority. It had the ability to bind a scholar in conscience over particular exegetical questions. Paul VI stripped it of that power. And Paul VI made the Pontifical Biblical Commission a branch of the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. In effect, Paul VI said, biblical scholarship is changing too quickly and we need to stop having the church put its full magisterial authority behind textual questions which may or may not uh, be the last word on the subject. Under Paul VI, biblical scholars ceased to be governed by a special office in Rome whose job it was to make specific judgments about exegetical questions. Scholars have their own integrity, scholars have their own authority, and therefore they will not be imposed upon and prevented from exercising that in a faithful way. This is the triumph of the historical critical method. And that historical critical method, its triumph after Vatican II to the exclusion almost of other methods, finds its ratification on the 100th anniversary of Leo XIII's Providentissimus Deus. In 1993, the Pontifical Biblical Commission issued a big, thick document called 